الحمد لله سابغ النعم وخالق الإنسان من بعد العدم فالحمد ثم الحمد ثم الحمد لك حمدا كثيرا طيبا يا رب لك أعطيتنا خيرا كثيرا ربنا سترت عن كل الورى عيوبنا ثم الصلاة بعد والتسليم على النبي المصطفى الكريم So today we're going to continue and we have two of our mothers to discuss today and time is limited so let us jump straight in. Zaina binti Khuzayma is our next mother that we will discuss and she is the uh, mother who have, we have the least information about because her marriage to the Prophet was the smallest, it was the uh, shortest marriage and why is this the case we'll discuss today. Zaina binti Khuzayma is <coughs> from the the tribe of Hawazin, she was not a Qurashiya, and the only other wife from the tribe of Hawazin was Maymuna. So Zainab and Maymuna, both of them are from the tribe of Hawazin. And <coughs> her mother, Hind bint Auf, we discussed her uh, in one of the Sira lectures in some detail. Her mother is called the most noble mother-in-law in human history. And I discussed this in some detail in the seerah. I'll very quickly go over it. You don't have to take notes because you've already taken notes, inshallah ta'ala, those two of you that actually take notes uh, in the actual seerah that we did. So I said that her mother, uh, and we're talking about uh, 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 Zainab's mother, her name is Hind, uh, her mother married three times. And from each of these marriages, she has daughters. And so each of these daughters marries some of the most prominent people in human history. So they say she is the most noble mother-in-law in all of human history. Uh, and these six daughters, from the first marriage that she had, she had one daughter. From the second marriage, uh, she had three daughters. And then from her third marriage, uh, she had two daughters. So two plus three plus one gives you six. Her eldest daughter is Zainab binti Khuzayma. Obviously the daughter of Khuzayma from the tribe of Hawazin. And she becomes uh, one of the mothers of the believers. Okay, So her first daughter, that's, that means her son-in-law is the Prophet wasallam. Then she had three other daughters. Maymuna bint al-Harith who also becomes a wife of the Prophet wasallam later on. So both Maymuna and Zainab are half-sisters from the same mother, not the same father. And they are not married at the same time. It is not allowed to marry half a sister at the same time. So Maymuna is married after the death of, of Zainab. So Zainab and Maymuna are half-sisters. And they both end up the wives of the Prophet wasallam. So she's a double mother-in-law to our Prophet wasallam. Then her third daughter is Umm al-Fadl. And Umm al-Fadl is the wife of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas and all of his siblings. And then her fourth daughter is Lubaba. And Lubaba married Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira. So that is the father of Khalid ibn Al-Walid. Okay, so Khalid ibn Walid's grandmother is this Hind we are talking about. From her last husband, uh, she had one girl, Asma binti Umais, and I gave a whole lecture about Asma binti Umais. She married Ja'far and then Abu Bakr and then Ali. So all of them are her son-in-laws. Abu Bakr and Ali and the Prophet Sussam, all her son-in-laws. Abbas, son-in-law, Ja'far, her son-in-law. Uh, just an amazing uh, person uh, uh, in, in that sense, in the sense obviously of her uh, son-in-law. But we are, of course... Uh, you know, going back to the story of Zainab binti Khuzayma. Uh, Zainab binti Khuzayma, obviously she was a, a, a divorced lady or a widowed lady. Who is her first husband? Actually, there are a number of opinions about who her first husband is. That's how much little we know about her. Ibn Sa'ad, one of the earliest uh, historians that I mentioned a million uh, and one times by now, says that her first husband was a distant cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Tufayl ibn Al-Harith ibn Al-Muttalib. So he is essentially the second cousin of Abdullah. So Abdullah, his second cousin is Tufayl, Tufayl ibn Al-Harith ibn Al-Muttalib. So uh, if it is this person, then he plays a prominent role he is an early convert. Uh, he is one of the first to shoot an arrow in the way of Islam. He's also the first shaheed of Islam in the battle uh, of Badr. And he might have also been the first person to lead an expedition after the hijrah, uh, even before Badr when there were minor expeditions going out. This Tufayl was the first person to lead that expedition. So he's a very prominent early Sahabi. What happens to him in the battle of Badr, his leg is cut off and the wound festers and he dies on the way back to Medina. And he dies in a place called As-Safra and he is buried over there. 
This is the correct opinion that Zainab bint Khuzaima was married to this individual. There is another opinion that she was married to Abdullah bin Jahsh, uh, the brother of Zainab bint Jahsh, uh, who died in the Battle of Uhud. Uh, but that is not valid, and we'll explain why in a while. So the correct opinion is that she is married to this person that we mentioned. He is the second cousin of the Prophet, Tufayl ibn al Harith ibn al Muttalib. And uh, she, being from a foreign tribe, she's a Hilaliya woman, and she is the, uh, the wife of the first Shaheed and a very prominent Shaheed. So there is no doubt that as the wife of the Shaheed and the first Shaheed of Islam, uh, that the, the fact that the Prophet married her is sending a very, very powerful message. What is that message? that the families of the shuhada will be taken care of, right? This is the first shaheed in Islam. Her husband is the first shaheed. So the fact that the Prophet is marrying the wife of the first shaheed is actually a very, very positive message to the families of the shuhada for all future, like the Prophet is setting the precedent. He is making this the, 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 the norm that the wives and the families of the shuhada will be taken uh, care of. And the marriage uh, with Zainab took place in Ramadan of the third year of the Hijrah. And this is why the fact that the, the claim that her husband was Abdullah ibn Jahsh cannot be correct because Abdullah ibn Jahsh died in Shawwal of the third year of the Hijrah and the Battle of Uhud. So her husband is not Abdullah ibn Jahsh, it's a mistake. So uh, the marriage takes place in the third year of the Hijrah just a few weeks after the marriage of Hafsa radiallahu anha, Ibn Qutayba says there were 20 days between the marriage of Hafsa and between the marriage of uh, Zainab. And this proves that, as we said, that her husband could not have been Abdullah ibn Jahsh because Abdullah ibn Jahsh died in Uhud, which takes place after Ramadan of the third year of the Hijrah. This Zainab, her kunya, was Umm al-Masakin. That is how people called her, Umm al-Masakin. And the reason why she is called Umm al-Masakin, the mother of uh, poor and the mother of orphans, is because she had a reputation, uh, even in the days of Jahili and the days of pre-Islam, that she would always feed the poor and the orphan. She would always share her food with everybody, and so she was called Umm al-Masakin. Uh, she only lived with the Prophet ﷺ for seven months. Some say only even three months. And uh, she died of natural causes in Rabi' al-Akhir of the fourth year of the Hijrah. So we have zero narrations of a hadith from her. We have no incidents in the seerah in which she plays any role because the time frame is so small. And that is why most of the people don't even know her name because the marriage was very short-lived. But she has one of the greatest blessings that none of the other wives shared. Uh, even though she was the second wife to die, obviously the only two of our Prophet's wives died in his lifetime. Number one is Khadija and number two is Zainab. There's only two. The only two that passed away in his lifetime. The, so, but Khadija died in Mecca. And that was before Janaza was, Salat al Janaza was made obligatory. So Zainab <laughs> is the only wife whom the Prophet page played Janaza over and then went to Baqir and then buried. And she is obviously <coughs> the first of the wives to be buried in Baqir. Okay? So all of the nine wives are buried in Baqir, but Zainab is the first of them to be buried in Baqir, and she is the only one whom the Prophet himself led the janazah for, and that is indeed a very, very unique blessing that no other person, no other human being shares, no other wife of, uh, of the Prophet shares. That is all that we have about her, no other information about her, because she was so short-lived. We now move on to our main lecture for today, because there's so much information that actually I have to condense because uh, we have to finish our series before Ramadan inshallah ta'ala we are winding up and closing shops so everything has to be finished by that time so we now move on to the main lecture for today and that is uh, Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha Umm Salama so much to say about Umm Salama Umm Salama who is she? Uh, she is Hind bint Hudayfa ibn al-Mughira, the famous Mughira, that is Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, that's the Mughira. So Umm Salama is from the tribe of the Banu Makhzum. She is a relative of Abu Jahl, of Khalid ibn al-Walid. In fact, Khalid ibn al-Walid is basically her, Khalid's grandfather is essentially uh, uh, her grandfather as well. So Khalid is her cousin. 
Khalid ibn Walid is her cousin. Abu Jahal is her father's cousin. So she's coming from the tribe of Banu Makhzum. On top of that, she is the foster brother of Ammar ibn Yasir because uh, foster sister of Ammar ibn Yasir because Ammar ibn Yasir and her, they shared a wet nurse together. So she is a foster brother to Ammar ibn Yasir. And she had some other brothers as well who accepted Islam later on. They didn't play any prominent role in the early Meccan Sira. Most of them accepted Islam after the conquest of Mecca. So Umm Salama, her name is Hind. So remember that her name is Hind. She's called Umm Salama. Her name is Hind. Umm Salama is one of the earliest converts to Islam along with her husband Abu Salama ibn Abdul Asad from the Qurashi tribe of Abdul Asad. So this is a couple from two of the main tribes of Quraysh, the Banu Asad and the Banu Makhzum. And these are two of the most important tribes of the Quraysh. Their union is a very important union because it brings together two of these tribes. And the both of them are very high nobility. And therefore their conversion was a big deal. It was an early conversion. And they are the first family to migrate to Habasha. So this is one of the blessings always mentioned about Umm Salama. She's the first lady to migrate to Abyssinia. And her husband is the first couple to migrate to Abyssinia. And in Abyssinia, their son Salama is born. And as the firstborn of the Muslim population of Abyssinia, it is taken as a good omen. So Salama is the child born to the Muslims in Abyssinia. And because Salama is so prominent, so then they're called Abu Salama and Umm Salama because of the birth of Salama. Salama is a very big occasion. Like a child is born in this exile community. It's a very big thing for them. So uh, Salama, then they become Abu Salama and Umm uh, Salama. They return back to Medina, sorry, to Mecca, and then of course the Hijrah occurs to, uh, to Mecca, and this is where the famous story takes place. I've mentioned it in the Seerah, and we'll go over it quickly again, uh, because again, I mean, uh, the, the stories we're doing now, we have to reiterate the Seerah, so I'm always... I'm always between two minds. Should I talk about the story in detail or should I say you've already done that and uh, obviously most of you have already forgotten the seerah six years ago but that's besides the point. So uh, in a nutshell, if you remember, Abu Salama, Umm Salama, the family decided to migrate with Salama, three of them. They're migrating on one camel and they take their belongings and they start to go towards Medina. What happens? This is the tribe of Abu Jahl. Do you think he's going to let his cousin, second cousin leave? This is Abu Jahl's tribe. He rallies the Banu Makhzum and they intercept the family with archers, with everything, right? And they say to Abu Salama, if you have lost your mind, we can't control you. They can't kill him. He's Banu Asad. Can't touch him. He's Banu Asad. They don't want to start a qabila warfare. He goes, you've, you've gone crazy. You want, to go, you want to go Muslim, whatever. That's your business. But this lady is ours. We will not allow you to take our tribes lady. So at gunpoint basically, they take their, you know, uh, uh, Umm Salama along with the baby Salama and they basically force him to migrate to Medina on his own. And they hardly get back to the camp of the Banu, the, the, the area of Mecca where the Banu Makhzum live, except that the Banu Asad have heard what has happened. And there's always tension and rivalry between the tribes as you know. And they become so insulted that how dare they have done this? How do they take their anger out? They take their anger out by marching to the camp or the area of Banu Makhzum and saying, okay, if that girl is yours, that's your business, but that little kid is ours, right? So this is pure jahili, just like, you know, uh, tribalism and whatnot. And so they, they take the baby, the little two, three-year-old kid, Salama, from Umm Salama, and Umm Salama remains without husband, without son you know within uh, you know a few hours like both are taken away and she goes into basically you know uh, she was very very grieved and depressed and whatnot and she would cry all day so much so that uh, the, the books of Sira mentioned she would go on the outskirts of Medina every single day and wait all day just seeing what can be done but her tribe has not allowed her to go and she cannot leave I mean they have the the cultural uh, you know, norms there, essentially. Imagine if you don't have the visa. I mean, she cannot leave. Nobody's going to take her, etc., etc. She cannot leave, and she wouldn't be able to go anyway. So every day she would be crying all day long, lost of her husband, uh, uh, sorry, taken away from her husband, taken away from her child, until finally one of her cousins saw her crying and felt so much pity that he interceded on behalf of the elders of the Banu Makhzum and just basically 
said to them, just let her go. What do you, she's, she's not going to harm you if she goes there and whatnot. So eventually the Banu Maghzum said, it's up to you if you want to go, go. And so uh, the Banu Asad by this time as well calmed down and they returned Salama to her. Some say a few weeks, it seems to be at least a week or so. So she was for a week or so in that very traumatic situation. And so she was so elated that she immediately just packed her stuff, took the, the, Salama, the, the, the boy Salama and literally started, you know, uh, going towards Medina with no entourage, no caravan. And this is the love of a mother and a wife. I mean, it's not the most rational thing to do, but what, is, uh, what else is she going to do? And she puts her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, with the iman that she has, Allah azza wa is going to take care of her on when she reaches Tan'im outside of Mecca. And she's on basically the highway. You know, and she's on the way to, to Medina. Tan'im is on the way to Medina. When she reaches Tan'im, Uthman ibn Talha is coming back from a journey. And he sees them with bags and everything. It's like, what are you doing? And Uthman ibn Talha is not from their tribe. He's neither Banu Maghzun or Banu Asad. He is from the Banu Abd al-Dar, uh, which is the tribe of the keys, right? Uthman ibn Talha, the one who is the keys of the Kaaba. This is Uthman ibn Talha. He says, what are you doing? And she says the, the whole story. And he knows, of course, what has happened in terms of the, 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 the splitting of the family. And so he says to her, this cannot happen. No lady can go on her own. I will accompany you. I will accompany you. And Umm Salama says, I never saw a man from the Arabs more honorable than him. He would walk with us on the camel. So the, she has the camel with Salama. He would walk with us until it was time to stop. He would cause the camel to sit and go and sleep at a tree. Then when it was time to go, he would come and tell me to sit on the camel, then turn away. When I would get on the camel, he would then walk and he did this every day until we reached uh, Medina. We saw a village on the outskirts, and it was the village of the Banu Amr ibn Auf. And he said to me, your husband is that city. And he then let us go, and he returned back to Mecca. Now, this incident takes up three lines in the seerah of Ibn, is 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 Ibn Ishaq. It just takes up three lines. But I really want to pause here for a second, and I want you to visualize and imagine a minimum 10 day trip, most likely 12 days. The minimum is a 10 to 12 day trip. You know, we do this in four hours in our cars or 45 minutes in a plane, even faster than this, right? But this is on foot. Uthman is walking on foot every single day. And just imagine the awkwardness of being with a non-mahram. Hours and hours and hours of sleeping in proximity, because you have to be in visual distance. I mean, anything can happen. Wolves can come, anything. You have to be in some proximity there of the food, of, the, of using the restrooms. There's going to be restroom stops, right? All of this happening. And subhanAllah, Uthman is acting like a gentleman. And this really shows us that, and at this time, he's an idol worshiper. He doesn't even come into Medina, you know? This really shows us that, and we know this because we live in this land. I mean, we see people... They don't have any iman in Allah, but they have good akhlaq. And that's something that is a lived reality. That some people have very genuinely caring and loving. I mean, here's a man, he stopped. I mean, we wouldn't give 10 hours to a stranger. He gave not 10 days. How many days? On the way back, he has to go. 20 days minimum. He gave a month for a person who is not even a tribe member. It's not even the same tribe. There's no direct relationship. He's a very distant relative. But he, he feels a sense of injustice. This isn't fair. What happened to you is wrong. And he g goes out of his way. He stops his own livelihood. He doesn't get a penny. You know, he could have even imagined. He, he said, I'm going to go to Medina. I'm going to ask your husband. Give me. No, it's a real humanitarian act that I'm going to do this you know, to, to, to help out. And he did this and khalas, he goes back. And here leads another very, very awkward theological discussion which does need to be said and that is that from our perspective this deed of his in and of itself would not have earned him jannah without iman we have to be very clear about this that good deeds are good in this world allah will reward you for them but only if you believe with iman will the good deed get you the reward of the akhirah and this is something that is, no matter how much we, because this is one of the big 
problematic issues of our times. Theologically, a lot of people, especially us and our youth, are struggling with this. They don't understand. And that's a, a deeper theological topic. But to be very, very simple about this, the rights of the Khaliq are infinitely more than the rights of the Makhluq. So no matter how much good you do to the Makhluq, if you don't believe in and have Iman in the Khaliq, then you're not going to get the rewards from the Khaliq that are really worthy of those rewards. The Makhluq, you're good to them, that's good, and Allah says He's going to reward you back in this dunya. It's in the Quran. Any good that you do, even if you don't believe in Allah, we will return all of their good deeds in this world and they will not be shown any miserliness. Every good that the person does. But if you want the Akhirah, you had better believe in the Akhirah. There's nothing illogical there. Why should Allah reward somebody with Jannah when they didn't do anything for Jannah? I mean, it's not even illogical. It's actually very logical. Why should you get the goal that you never wanted? So whatever their niyyah was, and this is something we have to be very clear about that. Uh, but another point though, and this is a very interesting point, is that it is true that if this person, Uthman, had died in this state, he would not have been of the people of Jannah because this we can say categorically. Why? Because he's interacting with the Prophet directly. There's no question that Iqamatul Hujjah has been done. You are dealing with the Prophet directly. You don't accept Islam. There is no ambiguity. There is no <clears throat> excuse here. And at this stage, he is not a Muslim. So... If they had died in this state, there is no Jannah. There is no possibility of forgiveness. But another point that we learn, generally speaking, good people are guided to the truth. Generally speaking, people of good are guided to good. And the two are generally the rule. There's always exceptions. And we know this from the world that we live in. There's always exceptions. So it is not completely out of the blue that Uthman accepts Islam before the conquest of Mecca. You know, he's one of the last. He's one of the last batches to make hijrah. Uthman ibn Talha along with Khalid ibn Walid, they are the last batch to make hijrah. It's not a coincidence that this is his own decision to convert to Islam and make his way to Medina when there is no conquest of Mecca. And so Allah blessed him with the hijrah and also the public honoring that Uthman was given. Again, he was honored like no other person in this regard. And that is that when Ali ibn Abi Talib and he got the keys of the Kaaba. And of course, it's understandable. The Banu Hashim want to keep it. Abbas asked the Prophet let's keep the keys now. Right, we already have, you know, the the siqaya. Let's also have the the the, the hidana. Let's also have the keys. Let's combine them because there's always been that rivalry that each tribe has been given one area of the Kaaba. And Abbas himself said, "Ya Rasulullah, let's yani khalas do it." And he had the keys in his hand, and in front of all of the people of Mecca, he said, "Aina Uthman ibn Talha." This is, an, uh, this is literally an award ceremony where the keys of the Kaaba are being handed to this person. This is not a joke here. This is not a trivial matter that Uthman ibn Talha is by name. He is brought in front of the Kaaba, in the doors of the Kaaba, in front of the conquest of Mecca. Uthman is awarded. And I say what he did to Umm Salama is not irrelevant to this honor that is being given to him. It's a package deal. It's a package deal. The goodness that he had to do something like that, it shows that there is so much good in him and that good is going to be rewarded in some way that eventually this happens to him. And so the Prophet handed him the keys publicly. I mean, can you imagine a higher award ceremony in front of the Kaaba on the day of the conquest of Mecca with the keys of the Kaaba and the one giving the honor is the Prophet Wasallam. This is the highest award ceremony in the history of mankind. Nothing can be higher than this. And it goes to whom? Uthman ibn Talha. And the story with Umm Salama, it's directly linked because it's a package deal. The goodness is now being rewarded. Even though it's not mentioned that, oh, what you did to my wife, it's not mentioned. But it's understood this is a gentleman. This is a real man who has done so much good. And the Prophet handed him the keys of the Kaaba. And then, of course, he said the famous phrase, this is yours generation after generation. No one shall dare take it from you except a zalim. 1,442 years have gone. And it is the direct descendant of Uthman ibn Talha. To this day, when the kings want to enter the Kaaba, they have to call the descendant of Uthman ibn Talha to come and open the door for the Kaaba. It is still in the descendant's hand and to this day and this is something that again is an honor that goes back to this individual Uthman ibn Talha anyway back to our story of Umm Salama so Umm Salama is reunited with Abu Salama 
and in the course of the next uh, two and a half years or so, she has three other children, literally one after the other. So a total of four children with Abu Salama. Salama, Durra, Umar, and Zainab. Two boys and two girls. Salama, Durra, Umar, and Zainab. Abu Salama participates in the Battle of Badr, so he becomes a Muhajir and a Badri, the highest level imaginable of a Sahabi. And then in the Battle of Uhud, he is severely wounded and he is put on a, uh, you know, uh, the bed that they would put for the hospitals or whatnot. They'd have a, a, a place where they would put the wounded and he never fully recovers. He keeps on getting problem after problem until he passes away uh, uh, half a year after Uhud in Jamad al Akhirah of the fourth year of the Hijrah. So he passes away uh, and Umm Salama now becomes a widowed lady with four children. So she is widowed and she is no longer as young as she used to be and she has now four children. So she will be uh, an estimate, we don't have an exact age of her birth, but an estimate is that uh, she is around in her late 30s at this stage. So, you know, the, she's not of a young age and she's not elderly. She's basically uh, in her late 30s. This is an estimate that is given. Now, the Quraysh, uh, the Arabs overall, they valued lineage, nasab, the most when it comes to marriage. In our modern Western culture, we value looks and money more than anything. But in their culture, lineage was number one. If you were the daughter of a famous Arab, if you were the daughter of a, if you had a pure lineage, they prized this like the Western society and now even the Eastern society prizes looks. So the beauty of a woman is number one in our time. In their time, the number one is Nasab. The lady of Nasab, they want to acquire her. For them, that's the way they are. Cultures are different. They want to have the pure lineage and whatnot. That's the way they are. Each culture is different and whatnot. So the fact that she is who she is and the granddaughter of, you know, and Mughira and whatnot uh, uh, and, and the famous Abu Banu Makhzum, she is getting proposals left, right and center from all of the elite of the Sahaba. Abu Bakr proposed for her hand. Umar proposed for her hand and the list goes on. Basically anybody who's everybody is proposing for the hand of Umm Salama and Umm Salama turned all of them down because she felt that nobody could compete with Abu Salama. She loved Abu Salama immensely and she felt that she doesn't need anybody uh, after Abu Salama. Then of course the Prophet proposed. So now the Prophet proposes to Umm Salama and even the proposal of the Prophet it is not accepted immediately. She sends back the message through the emissary that Ya Rasulullah, I have three issues. Number one, I am full of jealousy. I have a lot of ghira. Okay? And Abu Salama only had Umm Salama so she's used to having only, you know, no co-wives. Number two, I am no longer young. You know, you have Aisha, you have Hafsa, you have these are, you have, I am no longer young. And number three, I have children. Again, Hafsa, no children, Aisha, no children, no, uh, Zainab, no uh, um, Sauda, sorry, uh, no children. No, uh, who, 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 how am I going to compete with that? So these are my three issues. She didn't say no, but she didn't say yes. So she sent back the message, Ya Rasulullah, I have these three things. I'm full of jealousy. And I'm no longer young, and I have family. The Prophet sent back the messenger, give her this reply. As for your ghira, I will make dua to Allah that Allah will remove it from you. As for your age, then I am suffering from the same problem that you're complaining about. And as for your family, they will be my family. Can you think of a better response? I mean, what a beautiful response from our Prophet ﷺ. How can you say no to that? And so, Umm Salama accepts the proposal and she moved into the house of Zainab binti Khuzayma who had passed away half a year ago. Zainab binti Khuzayma has now passed away. We just mentioned her. So she moves into that house. Now, of course, here it must be mentioned, the hadith that all of you know, it is one of the most amazing hadith that I want all of us to memorize. We've all heard of it. And that is the hadith narrated by Umm Salama 
about calamities and tragedies. And it is reported from her own husband, Abu Salama. What, what an ironic and beautiful hadith and a poetic hadith as well, that Abu Salama came excited one day back home to Umm Salama in Medina, and he said, do you know what I heard the Prophet say? Do you know what I heard him say? He said that any time any person is affected with a musibah, and he makes this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace his musibah with a better uh, uh, thing that was taken away from him. Okay, Allah will substitute what was taken away with something better than what was taken away. And what is this dua? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufli khayram minha. This is the dua we should all memorize it. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Uh, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati. Oh Allah, bless or give me rewards because of this musibah. Yani reward me for my patience at this musibah. And substitute. Be, instead of this that has been taken away, substitute something that is better for me than what has been taken away. And the, the, the condition here, listen to this carefully Muslims and memorize it. It needs to be the first thing that you say when you hear of the calamity. Your mind has to go to Allah. Once you calm down, everybody thinks of Allah. As our Prophet ﷺ said, True patience is demonstrated at the first stroke of calamity. When the calamity strikes, that is when Iman is demonstrated. When you hear the news, right then and there, how do you react? Where does your mind go? Where does your heart go? The one who can think of this dua at that time, that's what's going to happen. And Abu Salama uh, passes away and the Prophet is there at his, at his death. And he makes dua for him as he is dying. Subhanallah, what a beautiful yani, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, p point to die in. And he prays janazah for Abu Salama. And Umm Salama, when she hears the news, she says, the first thing I thought of is Abu Salama coming back and telling me this hadith. Right? She's the, I mean, what a beautiful, she's the narrator. She's the one. Who, and so she says the dua. She remembers it. But then she herself says, and I said to myself, who can be better than Abu Salama? She was doubtful of the, of the substitution. And she turned down Abu Bakr and Umar. The standards that she had of Abu Salama were that high. Generally, you know, this is, subhanAllah, this is love for you, right? And then she said, and Allah Azza wa Jal did replace me. How can you compare? Okay, Abu Bakr and Umar, understandable. But the process, you cannot compare. And so Allah Azza wa Jal did replace with someone better than Abu uh, Salama. And there is a, a humorous statement uh, uh, from Aisha as well, humorous for us, not so much for her at the time, but that's the way uh, our mother was, that Ibn Sa'ad narrates that when the Prophet married Umm Salama, I became extremely agitated and sad because of what I had heard of her beauty. So it appears that Umm Salama as well, uh, you know, like Aisha as well, there were uh, things about her uh, yeah, mentioned. And so she said, I made an excuse to find a way to go visit her. Perhaps before this, there was no need to go visit Umm Salama, so she doesn't remember what she looks like, whatever. So I made an excuse to go visit her. And wallahi, I saw her much more beautiful than what the people had described. Much more, immensely more beautiful. So I came back to Hafsa, irritated and angry because they were, you know, they were one. She herself says, we were one together. And I'm complaining about this, but Hafsa calmed me down. And Hafsa said, this is from your own ghira, your own jealousy, and you're imagining this. And so Hafsa then made an excuse to go visit Umm Salama as well. And then she came back and she said, I saw her and she's not as beautiful as as you're saying, but yes, she is Jamila. She is Jamila. I mean, you're going too much. She's like, okay, she's good, but not, yeah, you're going a bit too much. So Aisha says, so the next time I saw her, then yes, la amri, and by my life, it was as Hafsa said, that my jealousy got the better of me, and I made her even more beautiful in my imagination than it was. So, yeah, but the point is that this narration tells us that she was a, a, a dignified lady, that indeed uh, befitting uh, to be a wife of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was also at her marriage that the ruling 
uh, for a polygamous situation was instituted where, uh, as the Prophet said to her, that if you wish, I will spend three days with you that are only for you three days, and then I will start the rotation. And if you wish, I will give you an entire week, but then I will make those extra four days up with them as well. And the, the, the point of fiqh is as follows, that if in a polygamous situation a marriage occurs, when do you begin the rotations, like the equal rotations? If you marry an unmarried lady, so for one week you will get a grace period. You don't have to begin the rotations with the others. And if you marry a divorced lady, it's three days. Then you begin the rotation. So this is... Uh, with uh, uh, Umm Salama or Prophet mentioned this and that's when it began this ruling in fiqh um, that alhamdulillah we don't have need to apply in our times alhamdulillah we thank Allah so, oh my wife's not here I can, oh no sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. Uh, we don't have to apply this ruling in our time so uh, this issue of three and seven it occurred in the marriage of Umm Salama radiallahu anha uh, she is also known for her wisdom and her intelligence and even look at the way that she managed the proposal of the Prophet Out of all of the wives of the Prophet uh, she had the reputation of being the most far-sighted, the most visionary, the most uh, wisdom. And the Prophet greatly honored her for this. And this has demonstrated a number of issues. Of them is the uh, Najashi uh, gifting the Prophet وسلم, some perfume and some garments. And he distributed the perfume amongst his wives and then the vial that was left there's only one he gave the vial to uh, to Umm Salama and so the actual bottle that was given from Najashi was given to Umm Salama and other things as well demonstrates the status of Umm Salama as well at least two verses of the Quran were revealed uh, not so so remember we said Jibreel only came uh, when the process was in the bed of whom Aisha but in the house, it is possible that Jibril might have come. So whether he came when Umm Salama was in the house or whether it was revealed when it was her night, we're not exactly sure. But there appear to have been two revelations that uh, she witnessed occurring. And again, we don't know the details exactly how. Uh, of them is the hadith of, or sorry, the, the verse of uh, the, the kisa, the verse of إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبْ عَنْكُمْ رِجْزَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Allah wants to purify you, the Ahl al-Bayt. This was revealed in the house of Umm Salama. And <coughs> Umm Salama mentioned that when it was revealed, so the Prophet called Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. Umm Salama is narrating the hadith. And that incident of the cloak, it occurred in her house. So it was revealed at that point in time. And <clears throat> also the other verse that was revealed was the verse that dealt with the tawbah, the repentance of Abu Lubaba. Do you remember Abu Lubaba's story? The repentance of Abu Lubaba who tied himself to a pillar. It is still in the masjid of the Prophet. If you go to the Rawdah, you will find it says there the pillar of tawbah. To this day, you will find there. It says the pillar of tawbah. And that pillar was where Abu Lubaba tied himself. And uh, he, he said, until Allah Azza wa Jal forgives me. After the battle of Khaybar, what happened with Khaybar, right? And that was Abu Lubaba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed in the Quran, uh, And there are others, they have confessed of their sins. And Allah Azza wa repents from them. So the Prophet smiled in the house of Umm Salama. Umm Salama says, what happened, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Jibreel just revealed this verse to me. So it's happening in the house. Okay? And Umm Salama says, Ya Rasulullah, can I go tell Abu Lubaba? And he says, you may. So it was Umm Salama. Now, the verses of hijab are going to come in a few months from now. It's not, ha not yet revealed, right? So the verses of the hijab of the wives of the Prophet is going to come after the battle of the Khandaq by uh, a few months. It's going to come in the same year, but later on. So she says, can I go and tell Abu Lubaba? And he says, yes. So she went and she was the one who informed Abu Lubaba of the fact that Allah had revealed verses about him. And Abu Lubaba uh, then said, I, I will only accept if the Prophet himself comes and unties the rope and then the process him came and did it so that is uh, in the house of Umm Salama radiallahu anha <clears throat> also of the uh, the main point of wisdom 
in the whole seerah from Umm Salama, you all know the story. I'm not going to go over that or else we spend a whole hour doing that. It is, of course, the incident of Hudaybiyah, right? The famous, famous, famous incident of Umm Salama's wisdom being shown and the Prophet acting on that advice when the Prophet told the Sahaba, we're not doing Umrah, we're going back to Medina, khalas, pack your bags and go and shave your hair. And after all of the tension and being so close and three weeks going by, people's moods are very, very frustrated with the Quraysh and everything happening. And so everybody just sitting there. Nobody obeyed the Prophet ﷺ at that time. They're just sitting there. And the Prophet ﷺ enters the tent of Umm Salama and he's agitated. And he, she, she asks what happened. He tells her what happened. And look at, again, her wisdom, her maturity. And as we said, out of all of our mothers, she was the one that was the most visionary and the most wise in this regard. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you do this? Go out, don't speak to anybody. And get the barber, the fulan, the barber, and tell him to shave your hair in public. Let's do this. So he immediately followed her advice and the rest, as they say, is history. Soon as they saw that. And this is the advice of Umm Salama. Now, a bit of a tangent here, yet directly related to Umm Salama. Some of our modern Muslim academics of the feminist strand, they read in Umm Salama as being the first Muslim feminist. That's the title they give her. She is the first Muslim feminist. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole feminist spiel, and you know my, my overall... Uh, analysis of this um, it's a different topic altogether um, maybe one day I'll give a lecture about this when I feel that there's not enough tension in my life I want to add some more tension and start some online campaigns to boycott me or something at this stage maybe I'll uh, life is boring I want some excitement but overall as you know I, I'm not sympathetic to third wave feminism whatsoever societal uh, sorry, gender roles are not just societal constructs. Gender roles are a biological and human fact and a historical fact. And um, I don't believe in this in this term altogether. We give the rights that Allah has given women and men. Uh, but they quote to a number of incidents in the life of Umm Salama that are definitely very intriguing. And eye-opening especially, so here's the problem, person like myself, I definitely don't ally with that, that crowd. But at the same time, we do have problems in the ultra-conservative strands of Islam as well. And we do have problems of, amongst men doing vulm to women, amongst men wanting to silence women. And Umm Salama's incidents clearly proves that they have also gone to an extreme. And by the way, each side feeds off the other. By the way, that's another point, right? Just like the far right and the, the crazies, they feed off each other. So too, you know, the feminists are a reaction to the ultra-conservatives, right? And then the ultra-conservatives become even more ultra-conservative because of the horror of the feminists. So it's a two-way street here. And people should use wisdom and see beyond that rhetoric. But the point is, this is a very interesting fact here. Umm Salama is asking questions about the rights of women. She's asking questions that's empowering women. And she, out of all of the wives, none of the other wives are doing what she is doing. And she definitely, therefore, she has this streak in her. And there's nothing wrong with that. And she, she's admired by the Prophet Sallallahu And that's the point. So it is true that, yes, there are gender roles that the Quran and Sunnah have come with, and there are gender roles that are biological and whatnot, but at the same time, there's a spectrum. And even within these gender roles, some men, some women, they are not exactly in the middle. They go more this way and that way, you know? So whatever you want to say about these normative roles, you will always find men and women who are not exactly in the middle of the, of the norm here, and there's nothing wrong with that. And Umm Salama is on the, the side of wanting to empower, wanting to ask, and she's asking questions that, if some of our sisters ask them, many of our brothers would object, how dare you ask? But this is the wife of the Prophet I'm asking. So there are a number of them, and I actually do plan to give a longer lecture someday. It's just I'm not, uh, I'm not scared of anybody, inshallah ta'ala, but I just not, I'm not interested in that right now. I have other things in my mind, but definitely, definitely, feminism deserves a number of Islamic lectures, and we need to discuss the pros and the cons, the good and the bad. There is good. There is good in some of this happening, and there's also things that I strongly disagree with. But the point is that Umm Salam is asking some very, very deep questions of them. Listen to these. I'm only going to mention a, f a few of them. She says, Ya Rasulallah, Allah always mentions men in the Quran. How about the women? 
you can see why modern feminists that are Muslim say she's the first feminist. Because the question is coming from that paradigm. Allah mentions the masculine, the dhakr. Where are the untha? Where's the inath? Where's the women in the Quran? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Al-Ahzab verse 35. Which is of course the famous verse in the Quran. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimati. Wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minati. Right? Wal-Qanitin wal-Qanitati. Wal-Sadiqin wal-Sadiqati. All of this. Khashi'in al-Khashi'a. Dhakin al-Dhakirati. All of this is mentioned. The believing men and women. The Muslim men and women. The, the, the fasting men and women. The charity men and women. You know, the, the ones doing dhikr and men and women. The whole list. Men, women, men, women, men, women. It's equal. Exactly. Then Allah Azza wa says, Allah has promised all of them a great reward. Okay? So, it is very clear from this verse, and I've said this very explicitly, that the genders really do have equal opportunity in the eyes of Allah to enter Jannah, and that is the real equality. The real equality is not of this world. Every one of us is treated according with our specifications, our qualifications, our backgrounds. The doctor is not given the role of the engineer. The engineer is not given the role of the mechanic. Everybody has a role to play. If four years of training can give you a different role, how about your biological birth, which is now being questioned as well. And by the way, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm already into trouble anyway. When you start questioning gender roles, you will start questioning genders. And that's what we are seeing now. With my utmost brutality and bluntness, for the last 25, 30 years, you've been questioning gender roles, gender roles, gender roles. Well then, khalas, you have eliminated gender roles by saying they're societal constructs. The next result is you will question genders, which is now what is being questioned right now. But that's a whole different issue. There are gender roles that are from Allah, and there are gender roles that are from culture and society. I'm agreeing. Some gender roles come from culture. Some gender roles are societal. I agree. But some gender roles are not. And that is explicit in the Quran. And the point is that if you look at this verse, the things that are mentioned are good deeds. When it comes to good deeds, there is no discrimination. Allah will not reward a man for his dhikr, qua a man, more than Allah will reward a woman. Allah will not reward a woman more for her dhikr, for her salah, for her sadaqah, just because she's a woman, more or less than a man. So, in terms of good deeds, the whole list, a dozen good deeds. And Allah says they're all equal. Yes, no problem. But we go to the next example. Also good deed, by the way. So the third example is the other one. So the, the second one. That she asked that uh, as well. She asked that, O Messenger of Allah, uh, Allah praises the muhajireen in the Quran. How about the muhajirat? Okay, so... Inna ladina hajaru. Allah mentions hijra, hijra, and the default is masculine, as you know. So she's saying, how about the muhajirat? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last verses of Ali Imran to respond to her question. By the way, notice Allah is responding to her questions. So this is another blessing of Umar Salama. At least three verses were revealed by Allah to respond to her questions about feminist issues. Feminine issues. I don't like the term feminist. Uh, and so Allah Azza wa Jal responded in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, that فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ Your Lord answered them. Your Lord answers them. What is the answer? أَنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى I shall not cause the reward of any of you to go to waste, male or female. Notice the reward is equal. Notice it is so explicit, wallahi. You cannot argue against this. The equality that comes in the Quran is the equality of thawab. The equality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your ubudiyah to Allah. The male is not a greater worshipper than the female just because he's a male. That is the real equality. And that's very clear in the Quran. Ba'dukum min ba'd. Each of you comes from the other. Every man comes from a man and woman. Every woman comes from a woman and a man. This is Allah's equality. How can you be competing against one another? Each one of you comes from the both of you. You need each other. Ba'dukum min ba'd. Falladina hajaru. Those of you who did hijrah. Wa ukhriju min diyarihim. And were expelled from their houses. Wa uudhu fi sabili. And faced harm because of me. Wa qatalu. And they fought in wars. Wa qutilu. And they were killed. Five things are mentioned. La ukaffiranna anum sayyatim. I shall forgive all of their sins. And I will cause them to enter Jannah. Okay? Now I have to be honest with you. Subhanallah. Yani... I have been reading Surah Ali Imran since I was 11 years old. Memorized it when I was 
13, 14. And I have read this hadith of Umm Salama that Allah revealed this verse to me because of me since I was also 17, 18 years old. Today as I'm preparing my lecture and the first time that light bulb went off, the five things mentioned are exactly what Umm Salama suffered. I never made that causal connection. It just doesn't, it, like subhanAllah, see people, I'm so daft sometimes, I couldn't believe it, literally. What was I thinking? I'm reading the verse, I know it's not, but I never made tadabbur until today. And I have to confess, like I really felt really sad. Something so obvious, and it only clicked what I'm, as I'm doing the research for today's Umm Salama, is like, subhanAllah, this verse is a biography of Umm Salama. Hajaru. She did the Hijra to Abyssinia, and she did the Hijra to Ukhriju min diyarihim. She was kicked out, right? Uudhu fi sabili. The persecution, being separated from her husband, from her, from her son. She was irritated for that. She was harmed. Qatalu, her husband fought in jihad. Qutilu, her husband died. Her whole story summarized in this verse. It's in the Quran. And this is a great blessing. Now again, I have to confess, I never, it never clicked to me. Even though I know the hadith for more than 25 years. I know the Quran for more than 35 years. I've not, but it never clicked until a few hours ago. And this shows how weak we are. May Allah forgive. SubhanAllah, I'm very sad. But this is the reality. We don't... Yani afala tadabbarun al-Quran. This is the reality. We don't make tadabbur to that way. It was only today, and I, I wish I could tell you this. I knew I didn't. It, literally a few hours ago, it's just reading. It's as if I read the verse for the first time. It's as if I didn't understand the meaning until the whole story of Umm Salama is literally there, and that's when it clicked. Like Subhanallah, you don't think anyway. This is anyway. I ask Allah for more faham and more tadabbur. It's a uh, uh, never-ending journey. Never-ending journey. You never cease to learn. That's the point. I knew this ayah and I knew this hadith for three decades. The ayah of almost four decades, but never click together until you're doing the, 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 the story together. In any case, so this is the second reveal. Now, the key for us to really understand, uh, and again, uh, I'm gonna, inshallah, someday I'll give a lecture about feminism, but this really, it shows us that the equality is spiritual and not the roles. Roles are different. And this is shown in the third incident. Umm Salama asked another question as well. Mujahid ibn Jabr says, that Umm Salama said that, Ya Rasulullah, we women are forbidden to go for jihad, yet men are allowed to go. And when it comes to inheritance, we only get half. Now what's she trying to say? She's trying to say, our sources of earning are less than that of men. How so? Ghanima, exactly. Ghanima is a major source of money. Ghanima is a major source of money. So she's saying, look, it's not our fault we can't go. The Sharia has said you're not allowed to go. Khalas, we can't go. But we need to get more money as well. I mean, she didn't say that, but you get the point. That's her, the way she phrased the question, right? Like, we're not allowed to go. Men can go. Yet, in terms of inheritance, we only get half. Now, before I get to the answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, this is really what shows you. This is really what shows you that ethics and morality is so finicky in nature. Umm Salama is looking at this scenario and she's complaining. No, I shouldn't say complain. Let me take that back. She's questioning the wisdom why we only get half. And she brings in, we can't go for jihad. The Sahaba on the male side use the exact same two things to question why women should even get a half. The exact same two things. The Sahaba, as is mentioned in Tabari and others, when this verse came down that we're going to mention, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, we are the ones who go out and fight, not the women. Why should they get half? Literally, imagine the women and the men are seeing the same two things and they derive the exact opposites from what they see. Right? That's the reality of ethics and morality. You can make a structured argument that is logically coherent from anything. Look at today's morality. Look at today's sexuality. You can make whatever argument you want. And it is in its own way solid. 
You understand what I'm saying here? Amongst this issue, amongst the men one side, the women the other side, they're looking at the same facts, the issue of jihad, and look at what they're deriving. And that is why you need a higher authority to tell you haq from batil, to tell you right from wrong. Otherwise, our limited minds can construct an argument out of anything. That's why there is something called the moral argument for God. The ethical issue, I gave a khutbah a few weeks ago about this as well, that for, for Muslims, we firmly believe that, uh, and this is frankly most modern philosophers from Nietzsche and others, and it, as Nietzsche said, basically without God, there is no morality. I mean, uh, um, many famous philosophers said this, uh, that when you once remove God from the picture, there is no morality. Anyway, back to our issue here. So what verse came down about this? That Allah Azza wa Jal says, and this is in the Quran to this day, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ لِلْرِّجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكُ وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اكْتَسَبْنَا وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ is the النساء Do not desire or be greedy for the things that Allah has given some over others. To men they have a share of what they have earned and to women, they have a share of what they have earned. Each one, this is the share that has been assigned to you. And all of you, men and women, ask Allah from His fadl. وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Ask Allah and Allah will give you other ways. Okay, money isn't the only thing. Perhaps a woman will also have satisfaction in some other way of the blessings of family, of life, whatever it might be. She might have joys in another way. وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Go and ask Allah from His blessings. So the point here is that Allah Azza wa Jal in this verse did not say, oh, the both of you are the same, the both of you are good. He said that for hijrah. He said that for dhikr, for khushu', for sadaqah, for salah. All of this the same. When it came to financial issues or issues of this world, Allah said, look, men and women are different. And this is Islamic feminism, not what these modern academics are about. This is their own Western version that they're trying to impose on the Quran. The Quran does not say this. They have to twist and distort or outright reject as some of their main figures are doing completely. They literally, anyway, I don't want to start that because I get very frustrated at this. The language that they use about the prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam, others is well known what their, what their iman is and they have to answer to Allah for what they do. But this is the logical discourse. If you are not willing to take the Quranic message, you will end up rejecting it uh, in this manner. Uh, and that's the reality. The point is that Umm Salama, and subhanAllah, again, let me just finish with this about the feminism issue. Don't quote me Umm Salama without quoting these incidents and how she reacted to them. She didn't complain after Allah revealed the Quran. End of story. Allah has spoken, end of story. This is real Islamic feminism. Sami'na wa ata'na. Okay, question. Go ahead. And let's see what Allah says. I'm not the one saying. This is Allah speaking. And Allah answers explicitly. Men and women are equal spiritually. You're both having the same cap capacity to enter Jannah. But when it comes to this world, There are ranks and privileges men have, women have, different. It's not a competition. The roles are different, complementary, society functions better this way. You're not competing against one another. You're on the same team. It's the team of the family. You work together. Each one has a role to play and Allah knows what is best. Allah knows what, is, what fractions are good for you, what fractions are good for you, and the both of you ask Allah for all blessings, you will get them. So, <coughs> the verse is very clear in this regard. <coughs> Excuse me. That when it comes to the matters of this world, genders are not the same. The man is not like the woman. You cannot be a third wave or postmodernist feminist and read the Quran and accept the both of them. There's a contradiction. But in any case, that's another point altogether. Enough of feminism. Back to Umm Salama. Anybody who quotes Aisha and Umm Salama and Khadija as paragons of feminism hasn't studied their lives, much less emulates them. Be like Aisha, act upon Umm Salama's iman and taqwa, and then I'll actually respect you. Don't pick and choose one thing from their lives and ignore the other. They are not at all like your version of feminism. They are true believers in Allah and His Messenger, and they embody femininity and not modern feminism, big difference between the two. In any case, so uh, I know this lecture is going to definitely get me into a lot of trouble. Uh, in my excuse, I will say, 
I'm not feeling well all the way, but I think everything I said is pretty legitimate, inshallah ta'ala. But if I were feeling well, I don't think I would say these things that would get me into trouble. Anyway, inshallah ta'ala, let's move on. Where was I? <coughs> we talked about Umm Salama's four children. <coughs> <coughs> the second of the children was Umar. And Umar, uh, there's a number of narrations uh, from the Prophet that he also did. Of them is the famous one in Tirmidhi uh, that Umar ibn Abi Salama said that I was a ghulam in the household of the Prophet and I rushed into the house and jumped into the food to eat. And the Prophet said to me, Ya Ghulam, Sammillah, wa kul bi yaminik, wa kul mimma yalik. The famous hadith of Umar ibn Abi Salama that he is saying, Oh, oh young boy. So the Prophet is teaching him tarbiyah and manners. Say Bismillah before you eat. And eat with your right hand and eat that which is next to you. The point is that these four children, they were raised by the Prophet ﷺ and he became a father figure for them. And there are a number of a hadith that they narrated from the Prophet ﷺ. Umm Salama becomes the second most copious narrator of hadith after Aisha radiallahu anha. And what facilitated this was many matters of them is her own intelligence. Clearly, she's a very perceptive and wise lady. Of them is that she spent relatively yani, six years with the Prophet ﷺ, uh, as his wife. And of them is that she was the last of our mothers to pass away. This is the key point of Umm Salama, the quiz question that if somebody asks you or if you write a quiz for the seerah, which of our mothers was the last mother to pass away? That is Umm Salama. So the fact that she lived the longest and the fact that she was so perceptive and wise and the fact that she accompanied the process on a number of key journeys, so she becomes the second most copious narrator of hadith after, of course, Aisha. She has... Uh, around 380 a hadith narrated in Musnad Imam Ahmad. Um, and uh, most of her narrations are from a fiqhi nature. 13 are muttafaq alayh, 29 are in Bukhari and Muslim uh, overall. And of her blessings as well is that she saw the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, uh, but not in his original form, obviously. It is mentioned that once... Um, uh, she looked and she saw Dihya al-Kalbi speaking with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said, who is this, Ya Rasulullah? Uh, and uh, he responded that it is, the pro that it is Jibreel. So she, she saw a figure and the figure in her eyes was Dihya al-Kalbi. As I explained, Jibreel, uh, if he were to show himself to a companion, it would be in the figure of Dihya. And the, he chooses, Allah Azza wa Jal allows certain humans to see. So the fact that Umm Salama is one of the very few Sahaba who saw Jibreel. Uh, this is a gift from Allah. Otherwise, he is invisible, uh, generally speaking. So she saw Jibreel, but she assumed it was Dihya until Jibreel left. So obviously, this is um, uh, well known that no nobody saw Jibreel and recognized him to be Jibreel until afterwards, except for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's also an interesting hadith. So, I mean, uh, uh, because there are 380, I can't do the hadith session with you. Just like with Aisha, what can I do with you know 3,000? What can you do 2,000? So similar with, with uh, our mother, Umm Salama, 380 is way too much. And so I'm just going to skip over that. But there's one that is um, just interesting, shows us a little bit about her relationship. So after the death of the Prophet, uh, she had a slave by the name of Nabhan. And Nabhan had agreed to gain his freedom, in Arabic is called mukataba, for a sum. And I've explained the concept of mukataba many times, uh, and that is that in Islam, uh, riq is very different than Western slavery. And in Islamic law, any slave has the right to get his freedom and negotiate his freedom with his master. It's a very strange thing for Western minds. That's why I don't like to call it slavery. It's not slavery per se, and it's not indentured servitude, something in between. It's a whole unique system. Any slave by text of the Quran that any person in riq can negotiate with the master that this is my f amount and he has to give, be given time to go earn that amount and then you pay the amount and you're free. So Nabhan did this mukataba with Umm Salama and one portion was left, 2,000 was left of that. And he then visited Umm Salama to repay that portion finally. So now he's going to repay the portion and become free. Okay, and uh, Umm Salama says to him, Ya Aba Yahya, that's his kunya, give this 2,000 to my nephew who's getting married, and once you give him that amount, then 
we shall never see each other again and we will say salam to one another. Why is this? Uh, because now you're no longer my slave. Okay? So then we will now be, so no more, no more can you come and meet me. Nabhan didn't know this fiqhi ruling. And he begins to cry. And he says, I'll never give it and just remain a slave then. Like, I'll remain a slave so that I can still talk with you and act with and see with you and whatnot and learn from you. He's narrating hadith and whatnot. I'll remain a slave. And so he had the money, right? But he, d he didn't want to give it because he's, he's going to give that up. Then Umm Salama says, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say that whenever the mukatib has enough to pay his debt off, then the owner should wear hijab in front of him. So if you have this money, then we will not see each other again. And then Umm Salama says, unless if you see me in the akhirah. So in the Akhirah, that's not where it is, applies here. So the very fact, subhanAllah, I mean, firstly, the, the issue of the, uh, the type of relationships that existed in Islamic societies between the master and the servant, they're unparalleled in Western societies. There was genuine care and concern. They became members of the extended family. And this is something that is understood and known when you read the books of history and seerah. They become, they're not treated the way slaves in this part of the world were treated. They're literally like members of the extended family and they have rights and privileges. And here's Nabhan, once he realizes what he has to do when he's going to pay the money, he's like, okay, in that case, khalas, I'll pay us, I'll remain a slave. And Umm Salama says, it doesn't work that way. We had an agreement and now that you have the money, technically you're free. You've come to repay, khalas, now you are free now. Even if you don't pay, you are now free. And this is the hadith that she quoted from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We already mentioned <coughs> last times <coughs> that the mothers, <coughs> our mothers were two camps. That Aisha was at the head of one camp with Hafsa. And Umm Salama and Zainab bin Tijash were the head of the other camps, right? And the, the actual leaders were Aisha and Umm Salama. They were like two friendly camps, rival. And I mean, like, they're not, they're not the best of friends, <clears throat> but they're also, there's minor tensions between these two strands, okay? So uh, Umm Salama was the leader of the other camp along with Aisha being the leader of the first camp. And that is in, in indicating her, her status and whatnot. <coughs> Urwa narrates <coughs> that when Zainab bin Tijahsh, whom we'll talk about next week, when Zainab bin Tijahsh passed away, Urwa went to visit Aisha. And Aisha was crying, even though Zainab was her rival. This shows you that there was still genuine love and respect between them, even if there's co-wife tension, which is expected. Zainab was crying. Sorry, Aisha was crying. So Urwa says... That, ya amma, ya, or my aunt, which of the wives of, our, of the Prophet was his favorite wife? And so Aisha says, I didn't ask him this, but Zainab bin Tijahsh, which we'll talk about next week, and Umm Salama occupied a high status, and I think that after me, those two were his favorite. Obviously, Aisha is number one. Everybody knows that. After Khadija, Aisha, everybody knows in Medina. After Aisha, Zainab and Umm Salama. In no order. And this shows us the status of Umm Salama. She was also definitely very active politically after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She wrote letters to Uthman because <clears throat> once she's in hijab, she's not going out anymore, right? She's the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She's writing letters to Uthman advising about policy. After the death of Uthman radiallahu uh, and the murder of Uthman, when she heard that Aisha was going to Basra, so you can tell, I mean, this is in her nature. She is wanting to participate in these matters, which is not the norm amongst women at that time. So this is not anything new. Some women are like that. There's nothing wrong with that. So now she hears that Aisha is marching to Basra. She sends a letter to Aisha advising her not to do that. This is not right for you. She wants to give her advice to not participate in what is going to become the battle of the camel. This is before it actually happens. So she advises that. And Aisha deflects and says, you know, I'm trying to call Sulah and whatnot. And Ali radiallahu anh comes to visit Umm Salama. And Umm Salama says, if I were allowed to, I would go with you. So she supported Ali radiallahu anh. And she said, if I could have, I would have gone with you, but obviously I cannot go. But she said, I will send somebody more precious to me than myself. That is my son. I love my son more than I love myself. And so her son, 
uh, fought on the side of Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib and uh, he was one of the commanders in the army of Ali and this is basically yani the, the, the one who the Prophet raised you know it's not a trivial uh, figure and this is Umar by the way the one who narrated the hadith here so Umar uh, ibn Abi Salama he fought on the side of Ali radiallahu an and during the time of Muawiyah and Ali she wrote Muawiyah letters advising him to give Ali his rights so again she's playing a very political role here and she's advising various people about what they should be doing. And then Ali, of course, is, عنه, is, is, is assassinated by the Khadijites. So she's the pragmatist and she understands that unity is important. And hence, when an issue happened in Medina and certain people refused to give the bay'ah to Muawiyah, she wrote a letter to the, some of the people that weren't giving uh, their, their oath. And she said, I commanded my own family, my own nephews, to give the bay'ah to Muawiyah. You as well should give the bay'ah. So this shows that she's leading a very activist life and it was accepted some women are like that and men need to understand that it's not a problem at all again we have to be fair to our text like I said one extreme should not lead to the other extreme and she was uh, of her sad you know things as well she was the only wife of the Prophet ﷺ to be alive when the massacre of Hussein happened and uh, it is said that she fainted when she heard the news and she was in very much grief. And there is a very, very strange hadith that scholars have been debating for the last 14 centuries. It's in Tirmidhi. It's a, six books and, and Hakim and Bayhaqi and others. It's a very strange hadith. Whether it's authentic or not is a big dispute and whatnot. And even Tirmidhi himself says, هذا حديث غريب. You know, this is a solitary. Gharib for Tirmidhi doesn't mean gharib, strange. It means solitary. And I don't know anybody else who narrated it. Uh, and this hadith goes as follows, that uh, one of the, the servants of Umm Salama entered upon Umm Salama and she found her crying. She found Umm Salama crying. And she said to Umm Salama, what happened? So Umm Salama said, this hadith is in Tirmidhi, I saw the Prophet in a dream. And there was dust on his face and his beard. And I said, what is the matter, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, I have just witnessed the killing of Hussein right now. Okay, I've just witnessed, I'm seeing this right now. And so she was found crying in this. And this hadith is in Tirmidhi, as I said, and there are other books that also mention this hadith. Uh, so this, uh, and she was the only wife alive at this time. All of the other mothers had passed away. What year did Hussein uh, die? 61 Hijri, very good, 61 Hijri. 61 Hijri is the death of Hussein. And after this incident, by a few days or weeks, Umm Salama passes away. So Umm Salama passed away in 61 Hijra. That is the year of her death during the Khilafah of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. The only mother to live till Yazid's time is Umm Salama. And she was the last wife to die. She was the last wife to be buried in Baqi'ah. And uh, her uh, uh, and uh, her janazah was prayed over by some of the tabi'un because all the senior sahaba had passed away in Medina. There were other sahaba, minor sahaba in there, but Abu Hurairah has passed away. All of the others have passed away. And so none of the sahaba were, were there for her uh, janazah. And yani none of the senior sahaba, you had the children of the sahaba who saw the process. And they were still there at that time. And uh, most likely she was around 90 plus years old. We don't have an exact date, around 90 plus years old. And <clears throat> her children, as we said, were raised in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Her eldest daughter, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, son, uh, Salama. Salama is a, a boy's name, but it can also be a girl's name, but it's a boy here. Salama was married to the first cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umama Ibn Hamza Ibn Abdul Muttalib. Okay, so Salama is married to the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and Salama lived a very long life until the Khilafah of Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan. Um, and you know, I just wonder, SubhanAllah, how I wish, how we wish we could interview Salama. What a life. We don't know anything about him other than two, three things. What a life. Born in Abyssinia, right? And he lives to the Umayyad dynasty. And he, from where to where this generation is just phenomenal. And particularly a person like Salama, the stories that would, he would have had and the, the life experiences. And then to see the very beginnings of the glory of the Umayyad Khilafah and literally and he had his time frame 
you know, Andalus is almost going to be conquered and sinned and whatnot. And this is essentially being raised in the household of the Prophet. This is Salama. He grew up in the household of the Prophet. What an amazing generation. But there weren't historians going around recording and whatnot at that time. So, what we do we know other than a few lines here and there? The second son, Umar. Uh, was made a governor of Bahrain during the Khilaf of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he also lived a long life and he died in the year 83 of the Hijrah. Uh, Umm Salama's daughter Zainab became one of the scholars of the Tabi'un era and so she's one of the main narrators of Hadith of the women's side. Most of the Sahabiyat, who is narrating from them? It is this Zainab, the daughter of Umm Salama and also a little girl raised in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this leads us to the end of Umm Salama. May Allah Azza wa Jal have mercy on her and exalt her rank. And to next Wednesday, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will do the very, very difficult uh, story. But I've already done it in quite a lot of detail. So I'm going to go over it relatively quickly of Zainab radiallahu anha, Zainab bint Jahsh. We will do that story. And then inshaAllah in another two weeks, inshaAllah, we will then be finishing up the mothers of the believers and with that we'll be finishing our series insha'Allah ta'ala any quick questions about Zainab binti Khuzayma or about Umm Salama radiallahu anhuma not a single question single question bismillah so <coughs> Hussein yes can that be considered a hadith the question is, can that be considered a hadith? So, this is a very, very interesting question. If Umm Salama, so generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, our scholars have said that anything that is witnessed in a dream from the Prophet is not going to be considered a hadith. This is the general rule. And uh, the reasons for this are, are many, but of them is that, uh, firstly, the person other than Umar Salama, any other person, how can he be sure that he saw the Prophet He could be mistaken in his assumption, because the Prophet said, Shaitan does not take my figure. Anybody who knows what the Prophet looks like, Shaitan will not take his figure. But what if you don't know what he looks like, like all of us, and you see a person in the dream? And you make the assumption, right? So no entity is going to come and say that I am the prophet. That's not going to happen. The shaitan is not going to take, not allowed to do that. But, but, what do you know if you see somebody in the dream and he's a bearded person and say, oh, I saw the process. How do you know? This could be your imagination. Now, in Umm Salama, that's not going to happen. She knows who the process is, right? But the scholars of hadith have defined hadith to be what the Prophet said in his lifetime. This is the definition of the scholars of hadith. Having said that, these specific rules might be exceptions only for the Sahaba. And I'll look into the books of Mustalah. I, I haven't looked at those books for many decades. My speciality once upon a time was hadith, but for, these, are, these are very technical questions, and I'm sure the encyclopedias that I have them, they might discuss this, but if a Sahabi sees a dream, in that case, the Sahabi, his verdict is different, in my humble opinion, because he knows what he has seen. But nonetheless, nonetheless, Umm Salama narrating it to us, whether we call it a hadith or not, is a technicality. If she saw the Prophet, it is him. And so it will be something true. Whether you consider it a hadith or not becomes a point of technical issue doesn't change the reality the, the issue comes about the isnad of this hadith is that the one who narrated it is a particular lady from the tabi'un and ladies from the tabi'un we don't have gener information about them this is our problem most of the ladies from the tabi'un era unless they were daughters of the sahaba but in this case the one who narrates from Zanima is one of the ladies of the tabi'un we don't know anything about her her, her authenticity her memory, etc., etc. So she's what's called majhula, unknown, question mark. So because of this, the isnad is slightly weak because, and again, this is technical stuff, but the majhul of the tabi'un are given more leeway than afterwards because the tabi'un lying was not 
done in that generation. It came after the wars that took place, whatnot. So because of this, the slightest weakness possible is the jahala of a tabi'i. This is out of all of the da'if hadith. This is like the one that's the closest to Hassan is this one. And that's exactly what this one is. And that's why there's this big controversy whether this hadith can be used or not. In Allah Azza wa Jalla's best. Inshallah, time has gone very late. So inshallah, we will stop for today and continue next week. Inshallah ta'ala. Where I'm not going to make as many blunders and gaffes that will be refuted later on on Facebook.